Oh my. Well, if the Lord can preserve His Word, I'm sure He can preserve my voice. Amen. Amen. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Galatians 6, verse 14. Well, I think that we showed California how much we respect social distancing and spitting and singing especially, you know. Like, we really respected the California's guidelines. Galatians 6, 14. Makes you wonder why the devil wanted to ban singing before summer camp. Made you wonder why the devil tried to scare some of us about social distancing and the virus and then the news just came out a few weeks prior to camp. Well, guess what? You're here and you get out the glory anyway. Don't forget, don't forget why all these things happen. It's not a coincidence. Maybe the devil knew that some of you would just taste the Holy Spirit tonight. Aren't you glad that you took a risk and went by faith and trusted God to come here tonight? You would have missed out a blessing. All right, Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. But God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and die unto the world. The Apostle Paul, he lived a life according to his own convictions, his own ideas of what, it's, what it means to live life. And he lived all the perfections of a religious Pharisee, but then he realized that the book of Philippians, that all of it was dung. His past life was dung. You know what dung means? It's trash. For some of you kids, it means poop. That's what it means. But Paul considered it all dung and behind him, and the only thing that he should glory is the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let me tell you something. Some of you, before you got saved in the Lord Jesus Christ, that false church that you went to, that sin that you lived unto, that life that you lived unto, was all considered dung, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. But some of you don't make it personal to you. And if you would make the old rugged cross personally yours tonight, then you would understand all the previous sermons about continuing onward for him, about singing, about shouting, about coming to church and serving God. Because all of this is not personally yours. Amen. That shout, did you lose it? Is that personally yours? Or did the pressure of the people make you do it? Coming to summer camp, is that personally your decision? Or is it something that forced you to do it? <coughs> Serving God and coming down on the altar, was that your personal decision? Or did something make you do it? I'll tell you why I came here tonight, because it was my decision, personally mine. And because of that, I can get a blessing out of tonight. And if some of you did not get a blessing out of tonight, you did not accept this wholeheartedly as yours tonight. Some of you are wondering why some of us are just so crazy and fanatical. Why some of these preachers are just so mean and so hard. Why some of these Christians have to emphasize about joy and loving each other. Why some of us Christians act sarcastically about wrong doctrine and false preachers and how our government is run. You know why? It's not personally your decision, not personally your thoughts. But if, you, if all those things are personally yours, your love, your joy, your anger, your hatred for sin, and a passion for the Lord Jesus Christ, you're at the height of bliss ever. And if you're not there, it's because it's not personally yours. Is this your decision tonight? I'll tell you what, it is mine, and it will be mine forever. The title of my message today is The Old Rugged Cross is Mine Forever. So I'll bow in a word of prayer. Amen. Father, I'll need you tonight to give me power in my voice. 
Heavenly Father, my thoughts and my everything is not intact. And you need to keep it intact for me to preach what is necessary, to preach a blessing to these people. Keep the candle run, burning, Lord. Keep the fire running. I pray, dear Lord God, that our shout and our joy and our praise will not die out here. Let it move on. Let the Holy Spirit run on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. My first point is stand for the cross. Stand for the cross. Yes. Okay. Look at the first part of the verse. It says, but God forbid that I should glory. But God forbid that I should glory. And that's my first point. Notice over here that the Apostle Paul, he used strong language. He says, but God forbid. He took a stand. He made a commitment. That's why he used this word, God forbid. That means nothing is going to move his decision. Nothing is going to move, uh, move his thoughts. He made a stand and a decision. God forbid that I should glory. On what? It's the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. The only way that's going to prevent you from quitting and from continuing on to serving God is that you make a stand tonight. You make a resolve decision. You make a commitment. Because if you say, I'm not going to quit going to church, guess what? If you made that commitment, then no matter what the powers of hell may throw against you, you're going to keep going. Amen. Didn't some of you say, I'm going to go to camp no matter what, and the devil attacked? And the devil tried to stop you tonight. The devil tried to miss you. Tonight's blessing, yesterday's blessing, and all the preaching's blessing and the fellowship. And if you didn't come to camp, you would have had a right to do that. It would have been a normal excuse, but dev the devil uses normal excuses. The devil uses good excuses. The devil uses things that would prevent you from coming here to serve God. But some of you said, I'm going to camp no matter what, and no matter how hard the trial was, you came tonight. Now you need to do that when you get back home, right? You need to say, I'm going to go to church no matter what. I'm going to get a blessing from this sermon no matter what. I'm going to go out and win souls no matter what. Stand for the cross. Make it personally your decision. Or are you waiting for a sermon that will just move you and just convict you and motivate you to do soul winning, to, to make you fellowship, to make you sing, to make you shout, to make you move others to come to a Bible-believing church. What are you waiting for? Are you a Calvinist or are you a Bible believer? A Bible believer believes that word of God, acts upon it, and does it. Amen. Now you move. Yes. You get your butt off your seat and you move. Amen. And take a stand. Amen. Let's say that you had a million dollars right now. Just picture that. million dollars. Man. Your imagination will run wild and you're obviously going to be, as soon as you get a million dollars, the first thing on your mind is, what am I going to do with it? What can I spend it on? What can I dedicate time to enjoy every dollar bill of it? And you're going to make time for that. You're going to set aside anything that prevents your schedule so that you can enjoy every dollar and not let it go to waste that's what you would do with a million dollars now think about that if you had the million dollars please please just try to follow the imagination with me I know you're all tired I'm tired too I don't know what I just said just now <laughs> but imagine with this million dollars, what are you going to do with it? Please be serious. What are you going to do with it? Do whatever you want with it. And if you only had one year, just one year, to use every dollar bill to what you desire and to what you want, you would not waste any time to enjoy it because time is limited to one year. And you would spend every day, every hour, and every minute on it But let's say that you would take the million dollars as yours to use, obviously. It's yours. It's not other people, right? It's not others to use. But what 
what if you only had one year left and you had a million dollars to do whatever you want? What if someone else used the million dollars for you and it's never yours to begin with? How would you feel? You'd be depressed, you'd be broken, you go, oh, I had everything planned out, I was going to do this, I was going to do that, I only had one year to spend it, and I was going to live up my life to the fullest, and then somebody said, it's not yours, psych, it's mine, then you would, how would you feel? Very hurt, downtrodden, maybe even angry. Maybe you would fight for the million dollars. Fight every ounce of your strength for it. But then, uh, worse than that, worse than that, what if the other person who's using your million dollars said, hey, let me trade my Monopoly million dollars, Monopoly money, which is a million, see that? Boardwalk, want that? Traded all of that for your real million dollars. And you are really stupid enough to think that, oh, Monopoly money is better. I wouldn't do that, preacher. Let's just pretend you're that stupid, okay? <laughs> Now, if you realized what just happened, then somebody told you what it was and you would beat yourself senseless and you would go, how, how much of a moron was I to give up this real million dollars for fake, for fake monopoly money? What a moron I am. Now, what's greater than a million dollars is million times million times million of what God has promised to you for all eternity and if God gave you every opportunity to live every million dollar of whatever you want which is gold silver precious stones and all of eternity you would obviously not let any cent go to waste and you would let your imagination run wild with, wow, God has given me salvation. What will I do with this million dollars that the Lord has given to me, this heavenly reward? What can I spend it on? Your imagination will run wild. Like, I'm going to go to church every day. I'm going to do soul winning. I am going to live for Him with every ounce of my being and enjoy every minute of church without complaining every moment of singing without complaining every moment of reading his word and praying without whining and no matter how bad life may be or try to interfere with my busy schedule i am going to use this million dollars that the lord has given to me which is heavenly rewards and not let anything interfere with it why would you why would you make a commitment like that because you know you don't have much time just like a million dollars, if you only had one year to use, you would not waste any time for it. And your lifetime is, the, the rate, the gap is so much greater. It's very, very small in comparison to eternity. Do you think that one year to use your million dollars is very small enough time? Your lifetime is much smaller than that compared to eternity. And you have a limited time, so you will not let anything you would not let anything interfere with how you're going to use the blessing that the lord has given to you through the cross of the lord jesus christ man when he died on that cross he's given you everything you know why because he gave up everything when you had nothing so that you can gain everything when you were a nobody he made you a somebody You had none to give to him, but he gave you all he had through the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. So you don't have much time, and you wouldn't complain or try to find something better to do. I mean, if you had a million dollars, you wouldn't do that. You would not do that with a million dollars. But you would do that with God's reward, which is greater than a million dollars. What's even worse is that this is your Christian life that God has given to you through salvation. When you receive Christ, it's one of the most beautiful blessings you will ever gain in all of history, in all of your lifetime. And it's yours. It's not others. It's yours. But what happened? Just like that million dollars you just you thought was yours, somebody came and told you that it's not yours, it's mine. And you believed it. 
And that was the devil. San Jose Bible Baptist Church, Bible Believers Baptist Church, A.V. King James Baptist Church is not yours. It's those other people's. It's not yours. That singing and shouting, it's not yours. It's those other people. Coming down the altar, that's for other people. That's not yours. Coming to summer camp, that's not yours. That's for your family. That's to please the church. To serve God and to fellowship with people. That's for others' sake. That's not yours. And the devil has robbed you every time of that. Saying it's not yours, it's other people. It's for others. And worse than that, worse than that, Satan gave you his fake riches, just like fake monopoly money, saying, isn't this much better than the real riches that the Lord has given to you? And he made it so beautiful, so real to you, but it was fake and deep as hell on the inside. And guess what? You were stupid enough to take that fake monopoly money from the devil. It was fame. It was possession. It was a bigger ministry. It was so that you can have a loving relationship. It's so that you can have children. It's a future goal and plan that you had in your life. And Satan offered that to you and you were stupid enough to take it. You said stupid, pastor. That's right. You're stupid enough to take it. You would call yourself stupid, wouldn't you, if you took the fake Monopoly money instead of a real million dollars? Yeah, you would. Nobody has to tell you you're stupid. You would know. But some of you don't realize you're stupid to take what the world offers to you. So I have to say it for you. You're stupid. Because some of you don't realize the loss. The loss of what you did. Of switching what God has given to you of what fake and what's temporary and cannot fulfill your life you think satan loves you as much as jesus the world loves you as much as jesus your lost friends and family members love you as much as jesus your own false church loves you more than god's church that he has given to you you're living in a lie and if you had that real million dollars in your hand i know all of you would take a stand to make a decision. This is my money and I'm going to do what I want with it. And I'm going to make choices and decisions of using every dollar bill. If you can take a stand for money, you can't take a stand for what God has given to you. And that's a crying shame. Money turns to dust, it's temporary, but what God has given to you is beyond all that. It's eternal. And you're going to waste that, huh? You're not going to say... You're not going to claim it as yours. You're going to say it's for Pastor Kim. It's for Pastor Gorski. It's for Pastor Stevenson. Oh, it's good for those people in church, but just not for me. What a lie. What a lie you're living in. Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. James chapter 1 and verse 22 says, but be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Now, notice the, how this goes. In these two verses, until you believe what God says first, then you will hear, right? Faith cometh by hearing. So until you, if you believe what God says first, then you can hear. Once you hear, then you can do it. The verse says, if you're hearers, then you're supposed to do it. And that became an explanation to why so many Christians don't care about doing things for the Lord, I realized. You know why? Because no matter how convincing the Word of God is in your life, no matter how much that Jesus has to spank you till you get your senses straight, no matter how hard the preacher has to preach fire and brimstone to get you to repent, no matter how many Christians have to say that they love you and be patient with you, be gentle with you, and try to encourage you back, no matter all those things, guess what? You're not going to take a stand. You're not going to do anything for Jesus because you don't believe what God says first. 
I realize that. You don't believe what is preached to you. You don't believe that sin is really sin. You don't believe that death is really death. You don't really believe that consequence is really consequence. You don't believe it first. If you really believed it, then you would repent, get right with God, and not only that, you would commit to it and do it. I mean, if God said terror of the Lord and you believe that first, you would take a stand and do it by serving God so you can avoid the terror of the Lord. I mean, it, it, God forbid, uh, I mean, I'm not saying this would happen, but if God were to say, I am going to send lightning down from heaven as soon as church is over, if you don't get right with, if you don't get right with me, and he did that in front of your face, you know what you would do? You would run down on the altar, you would repent, and no matter how stubborn or prideful that you are, you will do it. You know why? Because you believe what God says, that lightning will fall from heaven and fry you unless you repent and get right with God, and then you'll commit to it. Amen. But see, you don't believe him. You abuse his love, you abuse his grace. You don't believe, I mean, what's the point of all this preaching, huh? If you're not going to commit, if you're not going to make a decision and take a stand and say, I'm going to take a stand and serve God today. I'm going to make a commitment, like Pastor Gorski mentioned, on what I mentioned to one person, that if you don't commit to saying, I'm not going to skip church no matter what, when you're busy in college, if you don't commit to that, you will backslide. Guaranteed. Guess what? Guaranteed it happened. You know why? The person did not believe it. You don't believe it. If you believed it first, every word that you heard from the preaching, you would commit. Faith cometh by hearing, and if you hear, then you would do. Take a stand. But you have a I don't care attitude. It doesn't matter how much the preacher does to preach to try to convict you, to pray for you, and do whatever it takes, it's not going to move you. You still have a nonchalant, I don't care attitude. You know why? You don't believe what is preached. You, you, your critical mind is running. Oh, he meant it that way. Why did he say it that way? And oh, he, you know, uh, he's wrong about here and blah, blah, blah. See, you don't believe. If you took this seriously, that this is from God himself, you would commit and get right with God. You see worldly ambition more important than Christian ambition. And you want proof of that? The proof is why you would take a stand for the world rather than the cross. The proof is in these following questions. Why would you spend more time in your preference that you like to do? What is it that you like to do, huh? Is it job? Is it money? Is it family? I'm not, it doesn't have to be sin could be a good reason, good cause that you're spending most of your, the time in your life with, right? Like we have to work a long time because why? We got to make a living, right? That's an example. Some of you have to go to school and do well. So that's why you spend most of your life in that. That's understandable. But see, you got to ask yourself, why would you spend more time in the thing that you're prioritizing more than what God wants you to do. And you know what it is. You know what it is. That shows that the priority in your life, your ambition, was never God. It was the world. You take a stand that I'm going to wake up early to, <laughs> to do this schoolwork, to do this job, to take care of my family, and when mothers have children, it somehow changes their mind that I'm going to sacrifice everything that I want to take care of this child. All these things change. Why? Because they, that's their ambition. See, if you had an ambition, a passion, and a love for the Lord, that's your ambition. You would spend time on it. Why would you cry more about if you if some of you lost a job if some of you lost money or lost your home it's natural to cry about it 
But it's amazing you would cry more about those things than what is preached from the Word of God. Than souls dying and burning in hell. And that shows what's really in your heart. Your ambition is your own flesh, your own preference rather than God. It's easy, didn't you know it's easy to take a stand for Jesus? I noticed that. What's easy for people and for myself I realized is that to take a stand for Jesus becomes easy when you're committed, when you love it, when you're passionate about it. And some of you have experienced that in summer camp. Some of you ex have experienced that when you first attended a Bible-believing church and you said, this is it. And as long as it starts from there, everything becomes easier to grow. Now, do we all fall in sin? Of course. Does that mean your church attendance, your Bible reading, your prayer lights is flawless? No, it can be a struggle. It's difficult. Does that mean sin uh, is easy to quit and uh, it's not hard to give up? No, some of you are still struggling. But you notice the difference when your passion and your love is on Jesus Christ and you make a commitment, I'm going to serve God. It's easier to take a stand. It's easier to conquer sin. It's easier to attend church. And it is true for some of you who are witnesses, the Holy Spirit naturally makes you grow. Gives you victory over sin. Gives you victory in your prayer life, your Bible reading, and soul winning. Of course there's fear. Of course there's like a big gap that you're like, oh, I'm so discouraged. It's so hard to grow. But if you already make a commitment that I'm going to decide to follow Jesus, you'd be surprised at how much you will grow really fast. The reason why it's so hard for some of you, you didn't make a commitment yet. You need to make a commitment. Not like, oh, maybe, let me hear the preaching out. See, it's not personally yours. It's others you're thinking about. Not yours. You need to make it yours. Make this sermon your sermon tonight. Make this camp your night tonight. It would be a blessing for some of you during testimony that that is your testimony testimony that your life has changed and you said this camp this the preachings the singing the fellowship was personally for me and it changed my life and it's mine you know why it's more important for you for those worldly things than the spiritual things your ambitions are much more lie down for fame, possession, property, family, relationship, etc., more than the spiritual things of the Lord. The reason why is because you made those worldly things personal to you, but not the Lord. The house is yours, so if it burned down, you would obviously feel deteriorated. The school is yours. That's the reason why you'd work your butt off without, and sometimes you would complain, but you would nevertheless push yourself in your studies to get good grades. The job place is not easy and it's turmoil, but because you, you realize it's your job and you need to make money, it's personally yours, you do whatever it takes to do it. But not church, not coming to church, not fellowshipping with the brethren, not reading the Bible, and not praying. You didn't make it personally yours. You didn't. If it's yours, you know what you would do? You would take more special, serious responsibility over it. Sure, you might complain, but you will keep it to yourself and you would keep on going no matter what because you realize this is mine. My spiritual life, my spiritual walk, my blessings, my million dollars are at stake. Amen. So because of that, I will do whatever I can to take a stand and do whatever I can to live life through the fullest and use every ounce of it Amen. because it's mine. Amen. Is that old rugged cross yours? It's not made personally yours, is it? My second point is save for the cross. Save for the cross. Notice the next part of verse 14. Save for the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's one thing that is worth living, you got to understand. And that's not anything that you can have in your life. It's just the cross. 
Didn't you know that? It's just the cross of Christ. Save for the cross. Now, follow me once more, please. If you only had one wish, and think of anything you want, okay? Anything, anything. If you only had one wish, and it really happened in real life, what would it be? What would you say if you only had one wish in life that was to be granted? What would you honestly say? Now we know what comes out of, out of your unconscious, out of the depths of your heart now. What you really desire, right? You know what your answer should be? Not whatever you want, but whatever God wants. Now you might say, why would I make a wish like that? Because there's no greater joy than being in the complete will of God. See, you don't believe it. Go back to our first point, right? You don't believe it. You really don't. That's why we get ministers. We get Bible-believing people quitting in their Christian life, falling out of God, because the reason why is they don't believe in the complete will of God, that that is the greatest joy, the greatest opportunity that He can give to you. Because does it, let's just follow logically. Doesn't he know what you really want? Doesn't he know what you really want? A lot of times, you, uh, didn't you have it in your life that you said, oh, this is what I really want. And then later on you found out, this is not what I want. Oh, it's miserable and hard and I want to give that up. I, I regret my decision. I was stupid for doing that and immature and... So doesn't God know what you really want? Here's another thing. Doesn't God know what is better for you? Better. Better than what you want. Oh, I want this, Lord. And God says, nah, I'm going to give you a better one. Oh, I don't want that, Father. See, you don't believe Him. You don't believe what He says, that what He gives to you is better. Here's something that might be a shocker to you. Don't you know God wants you to be really, really happy? Shocker? Oh, God wants me to be miserable, to be sad, and to go through these things and turmoil and trial. Listen, there is sacrifice. There is cost. There is tears. There is persecution. Don't get me wrong. But if you think that living on a high drug where you're always feeling happy, always feeling good, is what means true joy, true happiness, you're in for a rude awakening. God wants you to be really happy. Well, you don't believe Him. You really don't. Get depressed. You worry. You get miserable. You get discouraged. And you feel like that your own way in life would be better than what God told you to stay on the road on. You know why? You don't believe. You don't believe what he says. Bible believer, huh? <laughs> How ironic. Not a term. Not a real true term to us. We don't believe what the Bible says. Here's another question. Does he really want you to be miserable and sad? He don't. Yes, there's tears, but what? Joy comes when? In the morning. He doesn't want you to be really miserable, true sadness, gloomy. You think God gets a kick out of that, seeing his children being in such utter misery and despair? So because I believe that he is such a good father that he won't make me miserable and sad, and that He will give me true joy. And that what He gives to me is better than anything that I can ask. That's why I can willingly say, if I had one wish, whatever, whatever you want in my life, Father. What are you afraid of, huh? You don't believe in His love. You don't believe in His care. You don't believe that He knows your limits and how He can grow you. What is holding you back to surrender to His complete will? Come on, brother. And some of you after preaching, after preaching, after preaching, after preaching, after preaching.
Hebrews chapter 12 verse 2 says, Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. You know, the verse says that you got to look at Jesus. How many of our preachers use Hebrews 12 so far? You are is the Lord leading you to a step now? What makes us continue, right? What makes us do things immediately, right? What makes us a quitter, right? What makes us keep building the wall and serving the Lord? What makes us not give up on His care and to think about lost souls and to live life that's for Him. All of what we've heard tonight, the past sermons in this summer camp, and all the sermons that you've heard, endless sermons every Sunday from the past years, all those things are coming to this point over here is that it's trying to make you look unto Jesus and live for Him and to despise the shame and accept the cross as personally your decision. All these preachings are done so that you can make a decision and a commitment to serve Him. And if you were to make a commitment now, and commitment, remember, can only come through believing. Believing He's a loving Father. Who wants to make you happy? If you would really believe and just commit to Him, then you would see so much of your life transformed and grown. But you are ashamed of those spiritual things because you only look at the shame and not the joy. Why? Because it's an old rugged cross, that's why. It's not modern. It's not up in times. It's not contemporary Christian music. It's old-fashioned. It's so 1900, 1800. It's so dark ages. And the world scoffs at the cross. Oh, wear a tie at church and put on your Sunday best. Women dress in their modest apparel in their dress. And these fanatics who look like Amish people singing old-fashioned hymns, you're attending something that looks like a... a, a an Amish farm, what are you people? See, you know what you're doing? You're looking at, the, that's the shame of the cross, see? Yeah. They're looking at those old, old spikes and that blood flowing down and the nakedness that the world just scoffs and mocks. You don't look at the joy. You look at the shame. That's why the old rugged cross is not yours personally. It's too embarrassing. It's too shameful. It's not something you're proud about. You know what? You know why some people who make commitments grow more easily? Because they're not ashamed to begin with. They love it to begin with. They believe God what he says to begin with. And they don't care whatever the world says. They look at the pain of the spikes going through the hands and the feet. The shame of it. They see the naked body of our Savior on the cross. Oh, the shame of it. The disgust of his flesh hanging down in ribbons and the blood seeping out. It's grotesque. The shame of it. But my friend, when I made that old rugged cross mine, all I see is salvation. Grace alone. Faith alone. Nothing of my own efforts, but by his own sacrifice. I see righteousness. I see eternal security. I see hope that lasts for eternity. Amen. Amen. The world scoffs at the cross, but it is something that I shout about. Amen. The world scoffs at you when you preach about his cross on the streets. You, if you don't receive the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ, that is the only way to heaven. There is no other way to heaven. The world scoffs at you. They scoff at the cross, but it is something you are proud about. 
you're so proud about it that you would say, that's right, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And let me add to that, Muhammad is not the way, Buddha is not the way, Confucius is not the way, Mary is not the way, the Pope is not the way. You're embarrassing yourself more. Shut up, just stop, you're embarrassing yourself. Calm down. No, you, you just motivated me. I'm going to keep on going. You're going to burn in hell if you don't receive Jesus Christ for your salvation. And that is your only way out. That is your only exit out. Stop, stop, stop. You're embarrassing yourself. And don't let, don't make me keep quoting verses to you. You know what that is? That is you are proudful of the cross. You take pride in the cross. You are not ashamed of the cross. You take glory, save for the cross. You take glory in the cross. But the world looks at it differently. They mock and they scoff. And that just motivates me to preach even harder without shame. That just motivates me to soul win even more without shame. The world, they scoff at you. Look at these fanatics. Throwing hymn books and running around the room and you know marching around. <laughs> yeah, calm down. Don't embarrass yourself, please. Please don't embarrass yourself. And then you look at them screaming at a rock concert, <laughs> waving their hands like a bunch of morons. And then you try to make a Christian, so then you speak in tongues and you embarrass yourself even more. Then you play that contemporary music and that apparel, that dressing that you are unashamed about. And you let the world see that shame and you're so unashamed of that trash. And you're ashamed when people dress their best and serve God and sing and shout about his praises on a Sunday. That just motivates me more to sing a little louder. That just motivates me to jump around the room. The next music garbage that some Grammy Award or YouTube would post online, I'm just going to sing page 67 and jump off a chair. Amen. And if somebody plays some rap music next to my car while we're stopping at a red light, I am going to play some blowout music where people are screaming louder than a stupid rock concert. Amen. And I'll have four guys with me on the seat. And I'm going to open the roof of my car. And these people who are listening to their whatever their rock music garbage that they're listening to. I'm just going to tune up that volume long, louder, and sing a little louder, and say, bless God, hallelujah. Man, when the, wor the world scoffs at the cross, it motivates me more to glorify the cross. Oh, calm down, calm down. No, what up on the devil? world they scoff at the cross because you're talking about dispensationalism whatever that term is King James Bible it's a cult you feel embarrassed when you're in a Bible group meeting and they look down on you and they see your shirt about repent or perish and they see that silly hat that you're wearing about a King James Bible because you got it from Randy Silkscreen <laughs> And then you got a picture of a burning hell up front and a glorified heaven on the back. And you got a scripture verse over there. And then some of you, because you have to wear a mask, you have a scripture verse on it. And then you're afraid what people will look at you. And you're afraid how embarrassed and ashamed you are. And the world looks down on you and scoffs at that. What is that? And they wear stupid t-shirts like, I love Justin Bieber. I love Taylor Swift. I love Obama. <laughs> Joe Biden for president. How can they be not ashamed for that crap? That trash. Right. That's right. Excuse me. Amen. I couldn't help myself. You know why? I glorified the cross. Amen. When that world glorifies their garbage, their trash, yes, sir. their hellish, damnable garbage, on, I 
motivates me yes, to sir. glorify Amen. Jesus. Amen. Come on. Amen. Motivates me to That's glorify right. Jesus. Three. Joe Biden Amen. for president. Joe Amen. Biden for president. No, Jesus is coming. Jesus yes. is coming. Yes. Jesus is coming. Amen. That's right. Come on. Bring back Obama. Bring back Obama. No, bring back the Bible. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. Get, increase social distance, increase the mask, and let the government take more control. And then let's submit and let's yield and let's comply. Let it grow, let it grow, let it grow. Let our kingdom grow. We've got to unite and not be divided. And let's bring in that one world government. And that just motivates me to talk about the government that shall be upon his shoulder Amen. and his kingdom shall have no end. And, and guess what? Your, their kingdom, their one world government will go one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year. I don't care if you put it three and a half or ten years at best. But, it's, but guess what? We're going one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, eight year, nine year, ten year. 20 years, let's times it by 240 years, times it by 460 years, let's keep going 300 years, 400 years, how long is the millennium? We still got time. The devil's saying while he's burning, am I done yet? God's like, no, we got 600 years left. Right there, let's go 500 years, 600 years, and there goes these little children playing with the animals. And then you see the leopard running around and you're just enjoying life. And you get these grumpy people during the millennium like, I'm not worshiping Jesus. I'm not going to worship him at the temple. And God opens up Gehenna and said, you want a bird? No, I'll go to church, says CNN. No, I'll go to church, says NBC. Don't go to church. Don't go to church. Why are you trying to bring back church? Guess what, CNN, NBC? You're going to bow to the king. You have to go to church. It's mandatory. By the way, you're going to have to get a first-class ticket to go to Jerusalem. You're going to have to go worship God all the way there, see him face-to-face. -face, and you're going to have to look at his face. And you can't be a reporter saying, oh, I got a question. Freedom of speech. Freedom of speech. I got a question. God looks at you with a rod of iron. And you go, okay, I'll shut up. Shut up, CNN. Shut up, NBC. We gotta make it mandatory not to come to church. And then when God does the opposite, you're gonna cry, you're gonna whine. Amen. And guess what? Uh, we're still at the 700th year, so we gotta go 701, 702, 703. Oh man, the, the governor says, you know, it's just only going to be a couple of weeks till you avoid going to church. And Jesus says, it's going to be a thousand years long that you have to go to church and worship me and bow on your knee, proclaim that I am Lord. Keep on going, keep on going, keep on going. And then here goes those underground people frustrated at the millennium. And then they're doing their Facebook, their Google, their YouTube. And then Jesus Christ is going to look at Zuckerberg and all those Google guys and says, okay, you're going to have to take out that video. You're going to have to take out that complaint. And what happened to freedom of speech? Oh, you have to worship me. I'm the ruler here. All right, that video, gone. Oh, the church is going through the tribulation. Ah, gone. Oh, God is a Calvinist and gone. Alpha and Omega Ministries will continue. Oh, uh, no, White, you get out of here. I'm the Alpha and I, I'm Omega. I'll continue on my ministry. Come on, bro. Didn't you know that Jesus is LGBTQ and then God's going to go, ah, oh, shut up. And then he'll shut down that video. And he'll say it's illegal perversion for children. Never dare show it to them. And if you see one, report it to the Millennial Kingdom at Jerusalem, and they're going to have to rot in Gehenna for that. Amen. Amen. They have these underground secret church meetings and spread on YouTube. You know the NIV is a little bit better than the King James Bible, the ESV. And then God's going to say, uh, get rid of that perversion. It's a perversion. Amen. It's a perverted perversion. Amen. Not the real version. Amen. Amen. Come on. Tell us. God's going to say it's King James only here. Amen. Amen. 
You know, in every tag on YouTube, it'll say King James only. In every video on YouTube and Google during the millennium, King James only, King James only, King James only, King James only. Here's the video. King James only is a cult. Oh, delete! Let it delete to Kahena. Let her out there. Amen. There are these people, you know, singing, Shout to the Lord all the way. And God's going to say, That singing is banned in my book. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, I want you to sing by opening up your white hymn book. Amen. To page 67. Amen. Hey, you pink haired little girl. Oh, guy, I'm sorry. Open up that page 67. Now lift up your voice. I can't hear you. Sing a little louder. Amen. And by the way, we're at the 800th year in the millennium. Let's keep going. 801, 802, 803, 804. No wonder they're going to be mad at God at the end of the millennium. Yeah. And guess what? They're still going to lose and God's going to win. Yeah. Oh, let the government do what they want. But guess what? This is their only blissful moment. That's Keep right. on going, That's right. man. That's right. Come on. Guess what? That's you're, right. you're not going to last forever. Yes, sir. we got a thousand years to make up on that. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Woo. Oh, that's good. Come on, Jesus. Amen. I am not ashamed of the cross. And those people who scoffed and mocked at the cross, who took great shame in it, one day the Lord's going to make them bow to it. Make yes, them sir. do yeah. it. Yes, sir. And you Christians, if you're still ashamed of the cross, my goodness, one day you're not going to have shame for him. One day you will be the one to giving him the glory. Yes. You have to comply to his cross, to his methods, Amen. to his glory, to his biblical standards. Amen. If you're ashamed of it now, then you're going to be a miserable person. What makes you different from the lost people during the millennium, huh? The unbelieving gripers during the millennium, huh? What makes you any different from them? Or do you share something in common with them? Because this world has brainwashed you. Take pride on what you have. It's an old rugged cross. It's a beautiful cross. It's my old rugged cross. I will cling to the old rugged cross and one day exchange it for a crown. One day, we're going to carry that old rugged cross that we take pride in. And some of you don't have a cross to carry that you can take pride in. And you reject it. You say, Lord, it's not for me. Then you have no crown to cast at his feet. Amen. But some of you here tonight who made a commitment, who take pride in the old rugged cross, just lift it up on high and say, glory to God. There's room at the cross for you. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it one day for a crown. And as you keep holding that old rugged cross high, embrace it and kiss it. And it is a life of sacrifice, a life of cost, where Jesus bled and died to give you blessing and glory and salvation and all everything that accompanied it. And one day as you carry that cross, you will hear that voice saying, come up hither and then that old rugged cross. It will transform into a crown. And one day, instead of, instead of throwing down that old rugged cross, you're going to throw down that crown at his yes. feet. Amen. Yes. Take pride what you have. My last point is slay for the cross. Slay for the cross. The last part of our verse at Galatians 6. It says, by whom... The world is crucified unto me, and I am to the world. To make it personally yours, as we heard one preacher said, everything, all exits have to burn. All other things that are holding you back, all those worldly things, simple things, all those things have to go. And what you need to do, the last point is slay for the cross. Slay. Jesus is not personally yours. The old rugged cross is not personally yours. You know why? Because there are other things you put in there that you think is still yours. Your relationship, 
your job, your preference, even your ministry. Whatever you want in life, you make it yours and not the complete will of God, the old rugged cross. You know what you need to do? No man can serve two masters, right? Hate the one or love the other. Hold to the one, despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Why you can't make a commitment is because you cannot slay. You cannot slay that fleshly, worldly, your loving self that's holding you back. You know what it is that you prize and you treasure in your life. Are you willing to slay it for Jesus? You need to slay it. And if you would slay it, then that old rugged cross will truly become yours. You know what would happen if God took away my family, took away my home, took away my money, took away my church, took away everything that I have in my life? Then I can still live for Him and have hope. You know why? Because those things were never mine to begin with. All I had that was mine was just this old rugged cross. You didn't do that, did you? If you make the old rugged cross personally yours tonight, there is such peace and hope and joy, no matter what trial or attack that you go through in life. There's a huge difference with clinging on to the money, prizing it, and when you go through a trial where you lose money, your level of worry is very high. But then if you made Jesus personally yours and your money suffered, and maybe it was taken away from you. Sure, there may be a little level of fear and worry, but there is much more peace compared to the prior. Why? Because you made Jesus more personally yours than other things in life. Money, possession, property, or whatever your preference is. Your family, your love life, etc. You need to utterly slay everything. The more you slay things in your life, the more the old rugged cross will feel like it's yours. And it's yours to own. Some of you got the sword of the spirit. Shield of faith. The armor. You know what you need to do? The devil is a dragon. And you need to be a dragon slayer. Some of you got your own dragons and you need to slay it. You can't slay it because the reason why is... You want to keep your dragons. You want to let them keep burning you. And sin burns. If that dragon comes out at you, what is it? Fear, worry, bitterness? Is it possession, fame, relationship, family, etc.? And that dragon comes out for you, you know what you need to do? You need to slay it. When you feel like there's this dragon about a whining spirit, a complaining spirit, a critical spirit that comes out, and it burns you up, it roasts you, and it says, complain, complain, whine, get bitter, be critical, complain, ha. Ah. You know what you need to do? You need to pick up that sword and slay that dragon. Yes. You need to kill it. That dragon's whispering in your ear, you need to cut off its head. You need to slay your dragon. If that dragon says, look at that old rugged cross, it's embarrassing. It's shameful. It's not much. It's, it's silly. You got better things to do in life. When that dragon says that to you, you need to cut off its head and say, I take pride and glory in the cross. Is the old rugged cross personally yours tonight, or is it not? You know, it's amazing what time the Lord will choose to come for us. The Bible says that the Lord Jesus Christ, He is seated in His throne of glory, yes? If He's sitting on the throne... If 
he's sitting on the throne, what's going to get him come up, right? Some of you, I know what gets you to come up. You know, you just sing about 200 hymns and you'll finally get yourself out of the seat. And you go, yeah! I wonder what would make God excited, right? He's sitting very, very patiently all this time. If he gets up out of the seat, you know what that means. He's saying, it's time, let's go. Man, I can, can you imagine, let's say the angel Gabriel is up in heaven. And then here's, man, those apostles. They, nearly every one of them died for the name of Jesus. Nearly every apostle. Paul was beheaded. John was exiled in Patmos. All the disciples were either stoned, beheaded, or crucified. And then the early Christians, they would be torn apart by lions while they were singing hymns in the Colosseum. And if they were crucified on crosses, they would take it as an honor and say, now I can be closer to Jesus. And then Gabriel looks at that and says, isn't that a good time for the rapture, Lord? Look at these people dying for your name, bleeding for you. And then God says, nope, not time yet. That's good stuff, amen. Yes, it is. Good stuff, bless God. But not enough to get out of my seat yet. Not time for the rapture. And you get where Martin Luther nails his thesis, more than 90 arguments on a Catholic church doorstep. And then you get Wycliffe, who's about to die, and the friars go to his bedside, hoping he would confess, and Wycliffe says, if I uh, revive, I'm going to kick you friars harder, and he did. And then, yeah, amen, bless God. And you can see these angels and Gabriel saying, Amen, bless God, keep going, kick that Pope, kick that Catholic Church. And then you see Martin Luther saying, If there is a hell, Rome is built upon it. And then you see where William Tyndale, he's about to burn at the stake, and he says, Lord, open the King of England's eyes, and the King James Bible is able to come out Make a way for that. Amen. And John Huss, when he receives this crown of dancing demons from his inquisitors, John Huss says, I can wear this shame because my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ wore a crown of thorns. And Gabriel's going, bless God, amen. And all these angels run around the room and they're shouting, bless God, hallelujah. God, get up out of your seat. Time for the rapture. God's like, yeah, amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Not enough to get him on a seat yet, though. Not time yet. Not time. I want you, but not yet. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, you got Jonathan Edwards preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God. And people falling off of their seats as if they're dropping to hell. And George Mueller prayed in millions of dollars. John Nelson Hyde praying so hard that his heart was moved from his chest from one end to the other. And David Livingstone dying, praying on his knees. And you get John Wesley converting a thief to salvation and saying, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sins. And then the angels are going, bless God, hallelujah. And Gabriel's grabbing that horn, that trumpet, he's saying, Jesus, now, right? Lord, right now, right? And God's like, oh, amen. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. God, this is the great awakening. No, not yet. Then you get a second great awakening. And then D.L. Moody preaching his heart out. And the one of these stupid news reporters saying, Mr. Moody, I counted over a hundred... Uh, scores of grammatical errors in your preaching. And Moody stuck out his tongue to that news reporter and said, Gee, that! I use that for the glory of God. What are you using yours for? Amen. 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 And then you get Billy Sunday, you know, running around the bases. Yeah, yeah and scaring away people from his church probably for doing yeah. that. Yeah. Breaking chairs, you know. Yeah. Ripping his outer garment. <laughs> and going, yeah! 
And then the angels are going, oh, I'm going to do that too. And they started running around the bases. You know, I can do better. I can do better. <laughs> and Gabriel's like, oh, man, I want to play that. I want to sound the trumpet, Lord. And then you get Finney, you know, going inside a factory, converting like the whole people inside the factory to salvation. They all had a church meeting. Angels are going, bless God, hallelujah. Gabriel's like, right now, Lord. And God's like, yeah, amen. Oh. No, not yet. It'd be a great time for the rapture, wouldn't it? But not yet. And it keeps going on. And then Gypsy Smith, raised by gypsies and then leading thousands to salvation to the Lord Jesus Christ. Mordecai Ham, preaching fire and brimstone, scaring every atheist that he could find going to every city he can find and saying, who's the hardest atheist to win to Jesus? And they said, oh, that farmer over there. And the farmer heard and he ran away and Mordecai Ham chased after him. And he said, I'm going to pray for God to kill you or to save you. And then he converted Billy Graham. He led Billy Graham to salvation. And then you get Peter Cartwright, you know, finding every liquor merchant that he can find. Beating them in the face and saying, All hail the power of Jesus. <laughs> you get Sam Jones being so rough and so hard that the preachers got together in the prayer meeting and they said, We got to pray for Sam Jones that he would calm down a bit and be more loving. And Sam Jones cuts inside the room and joins their prayer meeting and they're all taking turns so they can't they don't know whose turn it is and when it's Sam Jones turn to pray he says Lord I pray that you'll get these ignorant donkeys to repent and to realize that I'm preaching this because you want me to preach it Amen. then probably after that prayer meeting liquor, liquor store merchant waves now this part's a true story the liquor store merchant waves five dollar bill in front of Sam Jones and he says see that I got this from some sap who bought my liquor. And Sam Jones takes that $5 bill from him, puts it in his pocket, and he said, yeah, I'll keep that. The devil had it long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then the angels are like going, yeah, amen, amen, amen. And they probably got motivated and say, let's just try to find some devils and sing all hail the power of Jesus. <laughs> Two, maybe. And Gabriel's like, I'm about to sound the horn, Jesus. And Jesus slapped Gabriel's hand and said, not yet. I, I know it's exciting, but not yet. <laughs> then you get a character yeah. who listened to, who was on his way to hell and was about to commit suicide. And some man went to him Amen. and he led him to Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah. And this man was cussing while he was doing the sinner's prayer. And then that pastor, whose name is Pyle, said to this other man, Did you mean that? Yeah. And that yeah. sinner who was on his way to hell said, You blankly, blankly, better believe that I did it. Amen. 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 Then he cleaned up his language, you know, it took some time for the Lord to deal with him. He went to Bob Jones University like a good boy, learned Hebrew and Greek like a good boy, and then started to one up on them with start to yeah. one up on the devil on. with the word of God and use that sword of the spirit to kick Amen. and say that King James Bible is perfect. Amen. And then he started to preach hard. He kicked BJU. He kicked Liberty University. He kicked all 50 states in America and around the world, yeah. saying the King James Bible is perfect. Hey. And you get another guy, you get another man who was very shy in witnessing and was afraid. And then he heard about making tracks, so he went inside his kitchen, took all these papers, and started to make his own tracks that were comic style. And that man was at a similar age, similar background, like Dr. Peter S. Ruckman. Lived out in sin, who was going to go to Hollywood, try to make a name for himself. But he chose to just be a nobody, just making tracks simply put his name as JTC and that was it because he believed that he was nobody she take no pride and then all of a sudden millions upon millions of those chick tracks start to spread around the world 
that the Smithsonian Institute said this is the world's most published author. And then you see testimony after testimony of Chick Tracks saying, thank you for that, I got saved out of it. Catholics getting saved, Muslims getting saved, Masons getting saved, Jehovah Witnesses getting saved, Mormons getting saved. And then you get these idiots saying, oh, that... So Jack Chick comics, you know, oh, they don't save people. You know, you shouldn't use comics. That's just worldly. And who, who does he think he is? He's a King James only cult. And then here goes some nobody who doesn't have an educated degree from a seminary and just passing out chick track after chick track after chick track and getting soul saved. Amen. And then they died and they went to heaven at the same year together. Hey. Uh, and they hear the angels rejoicing, hey, this is awesome. And they're like, if there's a time for the rapture, it's now, man. It's now. And God says, nope, not yet. And all the Bible believers, they're like whining, Lord, shouldn't you have come back a long time ago? And Jack Chick and Peter Ruckman are looking at God and said, why didn't you come yet, Father? And God says, wait a little longer. And then what gets God off out of his seat was, when all of a sudden the world starts to scream out against Christianity and start to have a hatred for righteousness and for churches. And as the United States presidency changed, the demons start to flow out even more. There was rioting and looting. And there were people and, the and the internet sites shutting down Christian ministries and now shutting down churches. And then all of a sudden he sees these people just knocking on doors still preaching out on the streets, waving their King James Bible. And then all these angels are going, man, that's a blessing. And they're shouting, they're running around the aisle. And then, I mean, people are screaming and whining about BLM and Joe Biden, we need, oh, I missed Obama. And God's like going, shh, 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 shh. And here are these Christians saying, Lord Jesus, come back for us. We're holding the King James Bible. We're singing praises to you. Isn't this a good time? And then all of a sudden, some of these people got together at a summer camp at Labette, California. And then despite of social distancing and all these COVID-19 mandatory restrictions and you cannot have freedom, all of a sudden, God sees these people going, yeah, and throwing hymn books, throwing chairs, running around the room. And then the angels are going, this is a good time. And they're running around the room. And Gabriel's like, right now, Lord, right now, Lord. Wouldn't it be great if God saw his people <laughs> yeah. slaying the dragons? Amen. Slaying because there are so many dragons in this day and age compared to anything before. Yeah. And they're praising the cross of the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. And God is so angry. God is ready to rumble the tribulation. Yeah. And God longs for his people to be with him. And these people, they're weeping on the altar. They're shouting a little louder. And then the angels are getting pumped up. Uh, okay, it is well with my soul. That's great. Marvelous and wonderful. That's great. And then 10 minutes later, then the angels are shouting and running while the people here are shouting and running. <laughs> then when it came to all hail Emmanuel, <laughs> going, ah! everyone was screaming, <laughs> running. And then God's looking at all that and he's going, <laughs> yeah, come on, come on, amen. Joe Biden for president, Joe Biden for president. Praise Jesus, praise Jesus. And God's like, <laughs> amen. And just like, now Lord, now Lord. <laughs> and then all of a sudden when it came to the third verse, <laughs> the third verse, take up your white hymnals, please. <laughs> now open your pages to page 67 <laughs> all right now get ready and then some of these people are taking up balls or their song books and ready to run and then when it came to verse one yeah and God's like, ah! verse two yeah <laughs> verse three death sin and hell no longer and Satan's power is bursting twin and then the angels go wow and then God just can't help it wow and then the angel says it's time and they grab the trumpet and God slaps Gabriel's hand and said, I'm supposed to call it. <laughs> Come up. Here they are.
blessing. How can you sit down after that? Some of you are just so pent up after COVID-19. Some of you are just so angry seeing CNN, NBC, and Fox News, and all these wicked people. And then you're just, that's why you just cut loose all of a sudden. You go, yeah, glory! And you don't think, you don't think that God is ready to go, yeah! Now you know what you need to do? You need to slay your dragons, glorify the cross, let this world grow more wicked. And let our spirit rise even much more. And that would just motivate the Lord. That would just motivate the Lord. That's good, brother. You see those hearts on Valentine's Day that those hearts that reads, Be mine forever? And people hugging those hearts. Kind of a cute thing, I guess. Hugging those hearts, and this heart says, Be mine forever. Didn't you know the old rugged cross that God gave to you is the only thing in this world that shows Jesus Christ opening up his arms ready to embrace you as he's crucified, as the displays of his affection to you that he loves you and he says, why don't you be mine forever? Amen. Not under the condition that you sinned or, you know, if you didn't live well as a Christian. Who cares about that? You're eternally secure, so why don't you be mine forever? Amen. When is the last time you answered his embrace and made it personally yours, huh? When did you go to that old rugged cross right here on this altar, embrace Jesus and says, okay, Lord, you said be mine forever. Guess what? You're mine forever too. Here is your chance. The altar call is open. Amen. Will you embrace the cross? Here he is, his arms extended. Be mine forever. Will you embrace the cross? Will you love him? Will you accept his love for you? You did not, you never, you never made him personally yours. Why not tonight? Tonight, let it be your Valentine's night. Be mine forever. Let the old rugged cross be personally yours. The martyrs didn't care, you know that? The world right now, you know what the world's doing? They're trying to go up the cross of Calvary right now, trying to embrace the cross, but the world is scoffing at you right now. The devil and your flesh is mocking you right now, saying, oh, it's embarrassing, don't go. Don't let anything stop you from going to Calvary. His arms open. You know, there were people who spat and mocked at our Lord and Savior Jesus. That did not stop him from going up to Calvary, to the cross. Don't let anything stop you. Why are you going to church when you're about to lose your home and your money? Why are you being so passionate, so stupid for old-fashioned songs and looking like an idiot with the way that you dress for church? And, you know, you believe that those shows are sinful on TV. Those games that you play online are sinful. The world mocks at you. Let them mock you. Just don't let them stop you. Keep going to Calvary. Do you see Jesus carrying that cross? People jeering at him, plucking his beard, spitting at him. He didn't stop. He kept going up. You too. You too. Let the world mock you. Let the world make fun of you. Let them let let yourself be embarrassed. Don't let it stop you from going to Calvary. Hug that old rugged cross. The only thing you should be saying is, Jesus, opening up his arms, saying, I love you, be mine forever. That's all you should be saying. Not your storms, not your trials, not your pain, not your misery, not your depression, not the world scoffing and mocking at you, your flesh mocking you. Embarrassing you. Don't look at them. Just don't look at those spits, those jeers, those people beating you. Come on, keep carrying that cross. And keep going up that old rugged hill and embrace the old rugged cross. It's not too late. There's still room. There's still room at the cross for you. There's still room.
first little room. It's never too late. Will you embrace it tonight? Will you make it personally yours tonight? Make tonight yours forever. Forever and ever. The commitment that you lay down tonight. Lay a commitment tonight. And make Jesus personally yours tonight. Say, God, here it is. I lay it down. You're mine forever. Why are you afraid? Why are you stubborn? Why are you prideful? What's holding you back? Simple. You don't believe again. You don't believe on how much he really loves you. On his wonderful plan in your life. Give yourself to the old rugged cross. Now, if someone had the power to give you one wish, one wish, and whatever you wanted, what is your truest desire that you would say this time? I pray tonight it is the only wish that I ever want is that old rugged cross. Friend, that's all you can ever need, and your life will change forever. God has a wonderful plan for you. It's his love for you. You cling on to it. That's your answer. Saying, Jesus, I love you. The old rugged cross is mine forever. That will stop you from quitting. That will prevent you from sinning. That will prevent you from not serving him as much as you should.